اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لیسن نمبر 185 سورة النور آیا نمبر 62 انما المؤمنون انڈیڈ دا بلیورز دا پیپل ہو ریلی بلیو ہو آر دے دے آر الذین آمنوا باللہ و رسولہ دے آر دوز ہو بلیو ان اللہ and in his messenger what does it mean by this al mu'minun already are those people who believe in allah and his messenger so why are they being described in such a way again that innam al mu'minun alladhina amanu billahi wa rasulihi isn't it understood that a person who believes in allah and his messenger is only going to be called a believer that's understood so why is this being said over here because al mu'minun over here shows those people who are kamil in their iman who are complete in their iman because remember that iman is not just about saying that we believe but rather it is accepting what a person says that he believes in his heart and it's not only just accepting but rather it is submitting as well idan as well that a person does what is required so those who truly believe are those who believe they obey who allah and his messenger they accept them they accept their authority they accept their commands and they don't just say we accept but what do they do they actually observe them they actually follow them and they have sincerity in their hearts and a sign of that is that wa idha kanu ma'ahu and when they are with him meaning when the believers are with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ala amrin jami'in upon a matter That is jamir, that is collective. Amrin jamir, jamir from the root letters jin, meem, ayn, jam, and jam is to gather together. And jamir is one that gathers together, one that collects, one that brings together. So amrin jamir is such a matter, it is such an affair, which is a matter of common interest. which means that every single person must be there it's a common undertaking it's a common work that is shared by everyone you see there are many things that are only the responsibility of certain individuals and only those individuals are required to come and participate in that work isn't it so every single person is not required to do it and this can be applied in any area of life at home for example only the mother cooks every single person is not meant to go and stand in the kitchen and cook at the same time otherwise it would create a lot of problems similarly when people are working together in an organization for a particular mission then there are some tasks which require only some people to be there however there are some other tasks which are collective which means that every single person is required to be there he has to put in his share it's the responsibility of every single individual you understand so amr and jamir is not just any work but it refers to a matter that is of common interest that is general it concerns every person it requires everyone to be there like for example if there is a particular task that has to be performed every person is given certain duties then what does it mean all those people who have been given those duties must be there you understand all those people who have been given those duties must be there like for example when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the sahaba when they were digging the trench every single person was required to do some work or the other so this is what amrin jamir everybody is involved secondly amrin jamir is also understood as a task that is very very important because only very important tasks only very important works require that every single person must be there thirdly it has also been said that amr and jamir refers to those tasks in which the participation of every single person is an obligation by the deen like for example when it comes to salatul eid you understand when it comes to eid salah every person should be there when it comes to salatul jumuah every single man must be there You understand? So it's a requirement of the religion. So when the true believers, when they're with the Prophet ﷺ, and when they're working with him, 
on Amrin Jamir, a collective matter, a matter that concerns every single person, then what happens? What is the reaction of such believers? Lam yadhabu. They do not go away. Hatta yasta'dhinuhu until they seek permission from him. Until they seek permission from who? From the Prophet ﷺ. Earlier in the surah, we learned about those commands which are pertaining to how a person should be when he enters a place. And how should it be that a person should seek permission before entering? Now this command in particular is how a person should be when leaving. And especially when leaving from a place where he is required to be for some work. So how should he leave? Should he just disappear? Should he just walk out? No. He has to seek permission. حَتَّى يَسْتَأْذِنُوهُ Until they seek permission from him. And seeking permission from the Prophet ﷺ before leaving, this is what? A requirement of iman. This is something that completes and perfects the iman of a person. It shows his sincerity. It shows his commitment. It shows his truthfulness. And this is what separates a person from nifaq. This is what distinguishes him from hypocrisy. Because the munafiqeen, what would they do? They would disappear without giving an explanation or without taking permission. But the sahaba, any time there was some collective work, any time, they would not stay back. And they would not disappear without permission. So, حَتَّى يَسْتَأْذِنُوهُ Until they seek permission from him. If you think about it, when there is some collective work that everyone has to participate in, in which every person has been given some duty, some task to perform, what is it that would make a person leave that work? Think about it. Emergency. Okay, what else? He might think that something else is more important. Something else is more urgent. Something else requires him to be there. It could be something personal. It could be a personal issue. It could be a personal errand. It could be with regards to his work, with regards to his business, with regards to his family, with regards to his friends. It could be anything. So regardless of what comes up, they do not leave without permission. Because it does not suit a true believer that he disappears from his work. That he leaves his work unattended. That he leaves without permission. It does not suit a believer. Why? Because he takes ownership of his work. Think about it. Something that you like to do. Something that you feel is yours. Would you ever leave it unattended? Would you ever disappear from there, not caring about the work at all? You would never do that. Like for example, when a mother has a child, she considers that child to be her responsibility. Will she ever do something like, you know, leave the child in the middle of nowhere and then come back after some time? No, she would never do that. Because she takes ownership. She takes responsibility. Similarly, the true believers, the sign of their iman is that they take responsibility of any work that has been given to them. Especially when it comes to the deen. Because the deen is their personal matter. It's their personal affair. It's not the work of somebody else to whom they're doing a favor to. No, it's their own matter. They take it personally. And this is why they dedicate themselves to it fully. And if anything comes up, even if it's something personal, even if it's something very urgent, they will not leave unless and until they have taken permission. Taken permission from who? With regards to the Sahaba, from the Prophet ﷺ. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ Indeed, those people who يَسْتَأْذِنُونَكَ Who seek permission from you before leaving. أُولَٰئِكَ It is those people who الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ It is those people who truly believe in Allah and His Messenger. Just look at the emphasis over here. That unless and until a person is dedicated in this way, unless and until a person obeys to this extent, unless and until a person accepts the authority of Allah and His Messenger to this extent, his iman is not complete. His iman will be deficient. Because it is only those people who seek permission before leaving, it is only those who yu'minuna billahi wa rasulihi. They are the ones who actually believe. فَإِذَا اسْتَأْذَنُوكَ Then when they seek permission from you, O Prophet 
Meaning when such believers, when they come to you and they seek permission in order to leave, in order to go somewhere, in order to be absent from the work that has been given to them, لِبَعْضِ شَأْنِهِمْ For some of their matters. Shatn, as you know, is used for an important state of affairs. An important situation. So it's not that they're seeking permission for the slightest of things. That just because they want to take a break, just because they want to change their mood, this is why they just disappear from their work, this is why they're taking permission. No. Shatnihim. It is for some important affair, some major, significant thing, because of which they have to go. Again, they do not go without permission, but they come and seek permission from the Prophet ﷺ. So when they do come and seek permission from you, then then you give permission. لِمَنْ شِئْتَ مِنْهُمْ For whoever that you will among them. Meaning, the Prophet ﷺ is given the authority. He can either allow, or he can not give permission. It's up to him. Because the leader, the one who is in charge... He has that authority. Because if he lets every single person go, at whatever reason they want to go for, then what will happen? The work will be neglected. Isn't it so? And if every person who seeks permission is allowed, then the work will never be accomplished. Like for example, when people work at a particular place, can they just call up and say, too bad I'm not coming today, I have an emergency, I'm sorry I cannot come. I'm not feeling too well, I cannot come today. No. Even when people are sick, even when their parents are in hospital, what happens? They still go to work. Because they're afraid that if they don't go, they're going to lose their job. Isn't it so? And many times what happens? People request for a leave, but is it granted every single time? It's not granted. Why? Because the work is important. If you don't show up, the work is going to get affected. The business is going to suffer. Therefore, it's up to the leader. It's up to the in charge. If they think it is possible to give permission, they can give permission. But if they think it is not possible, then they have the liberty to not give permission. The Prophet ﷺ is told, فَأْذَنْ لِمَنْ شِئْتَ مِنْهُمْ And therefore, the people who are asking for permission, they should not mind. You understand? They should not mind if they're not given permission every time. Why? Because the leader does not have a personal grudge against someone that for no reason he will not allow. No. There is some greater benefit that must be achieved for the good of every person because of which you are not being given permission. Or perhaps it is for your own benefit that you're not being given permission. So, then لِمَنْ شِئْتَ مِنْهُمْ But if you do allow, if you do allow them to go, if you do allow them to leave their work, then what should you do? وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ And seek forgiveness for them from who? Allah, Allah. Why seek forgiveness for them from Allah? You've allowed them to go. Why are you seeking forgiveness? They didn't commit a crime. They sought permission. They did something very reasonable. They went through the proper channel. They didn't disappear. Why seek forgiveness for them? Because they were not able to do what they're required to do. Because they are missing on a major opportunity. And when a person misses a major opportunity, then what happens? He's missing out on reward as well. And when a person stays back from something once, then what happens? Then what happens? It becomes easier the next time. And he does not get the same opportunities again and again. What did we learn in Surah At-Tawbah? That the Munafiqun, they did not participate in the battle of Tabuk. And what happened? Because of that, they were not able to participate ever again. And because they had not participated previously, this is why they were not able to participate at the battle of Tabuk. So when a person stays behind from something once, then he is not given tawfiq again. It's very rare. When you deliberately stay back from something, when you deliberately turn away from something, don't expect that miraculously you'll get the same opportunity again. This is why the Prophet ﷺ is told that وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمُ Allah, Seek forgiveness for them from Allah. Although what they're doing is genuine, it is correct, it's not against the rules. However, they're missing out on something very, very important. It's Amrin Jamir. 
they're missing out on great rewards and it's possible that they lose future opportunities so seek forgiveness for them that may Allah forgive them so that they do get opportunities in the future secondly also seek forgiveness for them because they might be setting a bad example if one person seeks permission can I go what happens the other people even they get the confidence isn't it so like for example when you're sitting in the class if one person walks out what happens what happens you have the confidence as well and if nobody has gotten up then you don't have that confidence either so the one who dares to take the first step other people follow him this is why seek forgiveness for them wastaghfir lahum allah inna allah ghafurur rahim indeed allah is forgiving and merciful we see that when some people when they have gathered together for some collective work for a collective cause like for example the sahaba they would go out for jihad with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or for example at the friday khutbah every person was required to be there similarly many times the sahaba they were called to have shura when important matters were discussed amongst the sahaba with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at many many times the sahaba they worked together they dug the trench together similarly when it came to buying salman al farisi's freedom many of the sahaba they participated in planting the date bombs so there were many many things that the sahaba they would collectively work on but any work that they were doing collectively they were not allowed to leave without seeking permission and this teaches us a very very important lesson that when a person has committed somewhere when a person has given his name for something that he has said i will do this and this work he says i will be a regular student i will attend all the classes then what does it mean what does it mean that a person should not leave without permission a person should not leave until permission is granted to him and who is giving this command who is making this a requirement of iman allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is not coming from a human being don't take it as something personal against you coming from some person no this is something that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and then the leader at the time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was given the authority that he could give permission and he could also not give permission it was up to him like for example if everyone is working together and a person has to leave to take care of some personal errand he cannot leave until he seeks permission he can be given permission and it's also possible that he's not given permission because it completely depends on the circumstances it depends on the circumstances if the circumstances allow that a person may leave then okay it is allowed but if the circumstances do not allow then he will not be given permission like for example if you wish to take a day off for whatever reason it could be because you have an appointment it could be because you have to travel somewhere it could be because you have some work to do and it's something very very urgent you cannot leave it you have to go then what happens you come and take permission but sometimes the permission may be given like for example you are told okay you will be provided the recordings other times you're told but no you have to come and at least attend this one class or you have to come and take the test on this day isn't it so certain conditions are set so sometimes permission is granted sometimes permission is not granted why it depends on the circumstances and at this point a person should trust the in charge a person should trust the leader because they want good for you and they want good for everyone and sometimes what happens we are so concerned about our own matters our own personal affairs that we cannot look beyond the box we cannot look beyond ourselves we cannot look beyond that particular situation and this is why we become short sighted and this is the reason why the leader has been given the authority to either allow or not allow so what's the lesson in this ayah for us that whenever we have given our word whenever we have committed for something then we cannot disappear we cannot leave without permission because if a person leaves and others also become restless like for example at the time of jihad if a person moves from his position if a person leaves his post without seeking permission then this will create fear in the ranks of the believers isn't it so 
If one person leaves, it creates fear in the hearts of other people. They become afraid. They feel that they are weak. They feel they cannot accomplish the work. Think about it how, for example, if at school, at university, if you ever had to do a particular project, and you had to do it with certain other students, with a particular number of people, and it's possible that whenever you have a meeting, this one person doesn't show up. Or when you divide the work, one person does not do his work. What happens then? What happens? Who gets affected? The rest of the people. Isn't it so? They get affected. They get very upset with him. Because he did not tell them. He did not take their permission. He did not consult them. He just disappeared. He just didn't show up. He just didn't do his work. And as a result, everyone's performance is affected. Everyone's performance is affected. And this is why many times you may have seen, you may have done it yourself as well, that a person who is not committed to his work in a group work, then what happens? You take their name off. You tell the professor, you tell the teacher that they did not do the work, therefore they should not be getting any marks. I know of someone who actually experienced this and they never made this mistake ever again because their group, right when they were submitting the work, they took their name off. They took their name off because they said they did not participate at all. And when one person leaves and other people have to do their work, they have to do their work, all the work falls on them. And as a result, everybody gets affected. Other people, they have to overwork. They have to work extra hours. They have to put in extra effort. Like for example, it's possible that when we just disappear. Now remember that when we don't show up, what happens? Your daily report, your daily attendance, your daily lesson that has to be marked, right? That has to be reported. And at the end of each term, your attendance is also counted. We don't know if you showed up. We don't know if you came late. We don't know if you went late, if you went early. We have no idea. But what happens then? Who suffers? Who suffers? It's the people who have to mark the attendance. It's the people who have to calculate the attendance. It's the people who have to count all the marks. They suffer. They have to repeat the work over and over and over again. Is this fair? Tell me, is this fair? It's not fair. When we have committed to something, then we must prove our commitment. And we must show up. And we must not go against the rules. Because whenever we go against the rules, other people suffer because of that. Other people suffer because of that. And because they have to repeatedly you know, calculate their marks and calculate the numbers again and again, their other work also get affected. It affects their performance. It affects their family life. So we have to be very, very careful that whenever we have committed to something, we cannot have a careless attitude towards it. Because if we have a careless attitude, then we will suffer and other people will suffer even more. This is injustice. Remember that. This is injustice. Think about it. You and another person are given some work together. The other person does not show up. Don't you feel it's unfair? You get so angry at them. You feel so upset. So similarly, just as we would not want to be upset, we should not cause other people to get upset either. Now we see that the Sahaba, they were not allowed to leave the masjid after they heard the Adhan. After the Adhan was pronounced, the Sahaba were not allowed to leave. Why? Because this is Amrin Jamir. Every person has to be there. And if one person leaves, then the other person will leave. And then another person will leave. And you see, when a person has committed to something, when he is required to be at a particular place, at a particular time, to do something then it requires sacrifice. Isn't it so? Like for example, for you to be here on time at 9 o'clock every single day, doesn't it require sacrifice on your part? Of course it does. It makes you sacrifice your sleep, perhaps part of your breakfast, right? perhaps your relaxed morning routine. You have to sacrifice, you have to put in effort. And the true believers are those who sacrifice for the sake of the deen. What have we learned thus far? Repeatedly, that it is of the characteristics of the munafiqeen. They would never ever want to sacrifice for the deen. In Surah At-Tawbah, repeatedly we have learned that when it came to giving zakat, when it came to giving sadaqah, when it came to spending on the battle, when it came to traveling for the sake of Allah, when it came to participating in a battle, the munafiqun they would never participate. 
Why? Because it required sacrifice on their part. So a true believer, he will sacrifice for the deen. He will put in effort. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who knows about the efforts of every single person. And He is the one who knows about the sacrifices of each and every person. And He is a shukur He is the one who greatly appreciates. People may not know. People may not even acknowledge. But if you are putting in effort, if you are sacrificing, remember that the one for whose sake you did it, He has seen it. And His angels have recorded it. And He is the one who will give the jaza. People don't give jaza. So always, whenever you feel that you have to you know, sacrifice, you have to put an extra effort, and you feel this is unfair, don't think it's unfair. Remind yourself, this is an evidence of my commitment to the deen. This is how I prove to myself that I am committed to the deen. Now many times what happens? What is it that prevents a person from fulfilling his commitment with the deen? Whether it is learning, or it is teaching, or it is volunteering, what is it that prevents a person from fulfilling his commitment? Think about it. When a person thinks it's not that important. Because if you truly felt it was important, then you would give it your best. You would leave other things and give that work priority. Isn't it so? Like for example, whenever you're doing anything in the house, what is it that you do first? What is it that you make sure you do? What is important? And whatever you feel is not that important, you delay it. You leave it for another time. So sometimes people do not fulfill their commitments when they feel that the work they are doing is not that important. Another reason is that when a person thinks that whatever he is doing, he is doing it as a favor to others. He considers it as a favor to others. That look, I am volunteering. I'm not getting a single dollar in return for this effort of mine. In fact, I'm spending my own money. I'm taking time off of work, which is unpaid. I'm not working elsewhere. I could be making so much money elsewhere, but I am volunteering over here, so this is what? My favor. And when a person thinks like this, that he's doing a favor to others with the work that he's doing, then what happens? He develops a careless attitude towards it. He thinks he has a choice to do it or to leave it. To show up or to not show up. To come late, to go early. To not care about the timings. Isn't it so? Whereas if a person considers, if a person thinks that whatever work he is doing is actually a favor to himself, then it will show in his work. It will show in his commitment. It will show in his dedication. Like for example, when a person goes to work on time, And he does not leave before time. Why does he do that? Because of honesty. And also because he knows that only when he fulfills the time, the time requirement, only then he will get his money. In certain workplaces, as you enter, what do you have to do? You have to sign in. And your time that you entered at is recorded. And the time you leave is also recorded. And if you come one minute late, your money will be deducted. If you leave one minute early, your money will be deducted again. So people are so careful that if they ever do come in late, they will leave late. First of all, they will never come in late. But if it happens due to some reason, they will leave late. They will complete their commitment. Why? Because it is a favor on themselves. It's not a favor on someone else. They want the maximum benefit. They want to take the most advantage out of that work. Similarly, when we are working for the deen, remember that we are not doing a favor to anybody. It's not a business through which a particular person is gaining profit. It's not a family-run business through which some people are making money. No. This is a favor that you are doing to yourself. When you volunteer, when you work for the deen, you're in fact benefiting yourself. Because every minute, every moment, every deed is being recorded. And who will pay for that? Who will recompense for that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember in Surah Tawbah we learned that the believers when they go out in the way of Allah, they do not suffer from any thirst or any hunger and they don't take any step except that kutiba lahum. It is written for them. What is written for them? Amalun salih. For every step they take, So if you think of it this way, every step I take in this journey, 
I am being paid for it. What will you do? Increase your steps or decrease your steps? Increase them. If you think of it this way, every word I read, I'm being paid for that. Every word I read, what will you do? Come to the Jewish class or miss the Jewish class? What will you do? Think about it. You're being paid for every word you read. You will not miss even one word. Will you miss the du'as class or will you come late or will you come on time and make sure you attend the entire class? You will make sure you attend the entire class. So when a person thinks like this, that whatever work he is doing, if it's for the deen, he is being paid by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every step, every effort, every action is being recorded. Every action is going to be paid for. Then he will never ever neglect even one thing, even one duty, even one obligation. He will show his commitment. We should be convinced that this return, this recompense, this reward is promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes because obviously we don't see the recompense immediately, we don't see the reward immediately, this is why we don't get motivated. This is why we fall short in doing our work. But if we are certain that Allah is the one who is going to pay for this work, who is going to recompense me for this work, then our behaviors will be quite different. Many times, for example, being women, what prevents us from fulfilling our commitment is the restrictions that we face from our families. The restrictions that are imposed on us from our families. Like, for example, we have to leave at a particular time so that we can go pick up the children. Nobody else will cooperate with us. We have to do certain things, which is why we cannot take our tests, we cannot complete the assignments, we cannot show up to class, we cannot come every single day, we come late, we come half a day. Why? Because of the lack of cooperation that we get from our families, sometimes. This is also a reason, and it's a genuine reason. But many times, this lack of cooperation is a result of our own shortcomings. It's a result of our own mistakes. That the way we have portrayed the deen to our families, they have developed negative feelings towards this deen, towards this work. And they refuse to cooperate. That every time we go home, we have a face that is covered in tension and worries and stress. And that stress comes out in the husband, that stress comes out in the children, that stress comes out on the dishes that are being you know, banged around in the kitchen and the noise that is being created. And people are worried that, oh my God, there's going to be explosion any time. So because of this, what happens? People don't cooperate. They say, don't go. Don't do this work. Don't fulfill your commitment. They will not cooperate. Why? Because of our own shortcomings. Remember that when a person loves the work that he's doing, he will be happy. He will be happy. And this happiness will not be only at the time that he's doing the work. It will become a part of his life. It will be visible at every moment, in everything that he's doing. I remember I once went to see a specialist, a doctor, and um, he was very, very happy. Every time we went to see him, he had a big smile on his face. He was so energetic. He was so talkative. He would give you time. He would really discuss things with you. He would explain things to you. If you had any questions, you would do them. And my husband and I, this is what we noticed, that this man, he is so happy. He is so relaxed. He is so tension-free. Although the work that he's doing is so much, it requires him to put in so many hours. He's the only person who is doing this work, and it requires him to do so much work. But look at how happy he is. Why? Because he loves the work that he's doing. And every minute that he spends doing it, he has a smile on his face. When he deals with people, that happiness comes forth. So when we really love the Qur'an, which we claim all the time, then it's not possible that whenever we're doing our lesson and somebody comes up and talks to us, we tell them to go away very harshly. No, this is not going to be our way. So many times we face this difficulty because of our own shortcomings. Now, in the Sayah, what is being said? That when you have made the commitment, when you're required to be at a particular place to do something, you cannot go without permission. Now sometimes what happens? People want to go. They will try to take permission. They will offer an excuse that may be genuine, that may be false. Isn't it so? Sometimes people do that. 
Like for example, if people don't wish to show up for their exam, they will just go to the doctor, get a doctor's note and give it and they're not really sick. Isn't it so? People will do that. They're not actually sick. It will be a false thing completely. Similarly, people will say things such as my grandmother died and they've caused their grandmother to die like 20 times. Every time they have you know, an excuse for something, they will say my grandmother died. And where did she die? Back home. Well, did you go to the funeral? No. So, you know, sometimes people present genuine excuses and sometimes people present false excuses. Now it's possible that the other person trusts you and they give you permission. That the leader, the in charge, they trust you and they give you permission. You say you were very busy at home, whereas in reality you just want to stay home, have a day off, enjoy with your friends, watch some match or do something like that, go out and have some fun. And you tell you're in charge, you have a lot of family responsibilities. Now as people, we have been told to deal with people at the surface. To trust what people are saying. Do not doubt what they're saying. Do not doubt their intentions. So if somebody does allow, based on what you're saying, they're not at fault. Who knows the reality? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the reality. So whenever we are taking permission, remember, it should be for a genuine reason. It should not be for little, little things. And it should not be by presenting false excuses. And sometimes what happens? We want to take off. We want that we should be allowed certain things. We do not have to come take a test. We do not have to come attend class or something or the other like that. Just for little, little things. Things that are not even that important. Not even that important. And it's possible that we can manage both the things at the same time. But we prefer to have a day off. We prefer to take time off. Think about it this way. If you are ill, like for example, you know, you have your period. You've got cramps. Because of that, some people, they will not come to class. They will not come to class because I'm having cramps. Every woman gets cramps. Some people have it worse. Other people have it less worse. Right? Some people have it really bad. Other people don't have it that bad. But remember that if other people can do it, you can do it too. You can also do it. It's not really such a thing because of which you should miss the entire class, because of which you should come and take permission to be absent for the entire day. It's not that big of a reason. Similarly, sometimes for appointments. We have an appointment, this is why we have to go. This is why we cannot come. This is why we have to leave early. This is why we're going to come in late. Whereas tell me, when you are at work, when do you book your appointments? During work hours? No, not during work hours. I'm sure you know of many people who work, who go to universities, who go to school. And they are also human beings. They also get sick. Even they need to go to the doctor. But when do they go? Not during their work hours. Outside of the work hours. No matter how sick they are. No matter how urgently they need to go. And alhamdulillah, the country that we're living in, the places that we're in, it's possible to have appointments during the morning. It's possible to have appointments during the day. Early morning, 7 o'clock, many places open up. And they're open until 6 p.m. And our classes, they end at 3 p.m. So do we really have to make an appointment at 2? Do we really have to make an appointment at 11? Can we not move it? Now there are certain things which, you know, the timings of which are fixed. You really have a small window. You cannot move it. Okay, that seems like a genuine reason. But we should really see what is our priority. Whatever is our priority, we will give preference to that. We will not prefer anything above that. We see that Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was leaving Medina, he was going for Umrah. He was going for Umrah and he was going to Makkah. He went to the Prophet wasallam and he asked permission. That may I go? Just imagine, what do we think? You don't need to take other people's permission when you're doing something good. But the fact is that when you have committed when you have made a commitment somewhere, then you cannot just leave for your own personal benefit. Because others are going to get affected. And it's very, very disrespectful that a person leaves without even taking permission. Many times, what is our attitude? We don't take permission, we just inform. We just tell people, we will not be coming because of this reason. Whereas what word has been used over here? That they should inform you? Has the word naba been used over here? No. What word has been used over here? Idhan. Idhan is different from naba. Naba is inform and idhan is to take permission. 
There is a difference between the two. Umar radiallahu anhu, he sought permission if he could go for Umrah. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ said to him, O Abu Hafs, do not forget us in your prayers. Meaning go, and when you go, don't forget us in your prayers. Now, in this ayah, although the Prophet ﷺ is being mentioned in particular, that when the people wish to go, they must take permission from you, and it's up to you whether you give permission or not. So although the Prophet ﷺ is being mentioned, but remember that any time the Prophet ﷺ is addressed in the Qur'an, that address is understood in three ways. First of all, that address is exclusively for him. It cannot be applied to anybody else. Secondly, it is an address that is to him, but in reality, other people are being told. Like for example, لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ amaluk. That if you do shirk, then your actions would be wasted. Is it ever possible that the Prophet ﷺ would do shirk? Was it ever expected of him? No. So in reality, who is being told? The people are being told that if you do shirk, then your good deeds are going to be wasted. And thirdly, the command is such that it is for him and also for others. It is عام. It is general. It is for him and also for others. So over here, the Prophet ﷺ is being spoken of directly, but the command is general. The instruction is general. That whenever the believers have collected for some work, whether the Prophet ﷺ is amongst them or not, this is how they should be. That they should not leave without permission. Because when they will not leave without permission, this shows their commitment, this shows their sincerity. Think about it. If a person works somewhere, can he come and go as he pleases? No. Can he take a day off? No. Can he take half a day off? Can he leave early? Can he come late? Many, many times I see, it's not even three o'clock, and so many people are leaving the class. So many people are leaving the class. And I wonder, okay, you will get two minutes, you will get five minutes, you will get ten minutes, what will you achieve? And what will you lose? Think about it. Be honest with yourself. Forget about other people. Be honest with yourself. What am I missing and what am I gaining? What is more important? Yesterday we learned about the elderly women. That if they continue to wear the hijab, it is better for them. Why? Because once they have started something, they should take it all the way to the end. They should complete it. Similarly, once we have started something, then we should take it all the way to the end. Really, what's the difference if you leave five minutes early or on time? There isn't much of a difference. Except in reward. Except in fulfilling your commitment. I was uh, discussing this with someone yesterday that the commitment to the deen is such a delicate relationship that, uh, for example, like you're not getting any worldly benefit. Or so it seems you're not getting any worldly benefit. And on top of that, you have so much emotional pressure. Because this job does have a lot of emotional pressure. And you have to channel it the right way. And then you're wondering, how do I channel it the right way? There's so many things involved. But at the end of the day, if you think that this is only for your individual sake, meaning my own sake, I'm not doing it for anyone else. I'm doing it for my akhirah. I'm doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I want to get reward. I want to get jannah. I'm going to strive. I'm going to balance everything. Then it becomes easier. But if you don't take it like that, and then you take it as like a burden, yes. this commitment to the deen, oh my God, you know, this person saying this to me. Oh, now this person's checking on me. And now this person's checking on me. Because we all get checked. Yes. We all get checked. Even us. And so we're like, you know, if you think, oh, you know, I'm going to leave this work because such and such person said this to me. We're it's only going to cause loss to ourselves. So everyone should take it for themselves that I am creating my akhirah. I will try my best. I will do as much as I can in my capacity. Exactly. And that's all that's required of you. Yes. And this is the commitment that you're making with yourself. This is you doing a favor to yourself. You're not doing a favor to anybody else. And always remind yourself, every step, every moment of thirst, every moment of hunger is being recorded. You know that ayah of Surah Tawbah, it's so motivational. If you read it every day, if you remind yourself of it every day, it's not possible that you'll stay behind. It's not possible that you'll ever think you're doing this work as a favor to someone else. You're doing this as a favor to yourself. Because you are the first person to benefit. The first person. So when you become so concerned about your own benefit, then you will not care about how other people are being towards you, how other people are putting a pressure on you, how other people are keeping a check on you. No, you'll be concerned about yourself. You yourself will motivate yourself. 
you are your own driving force, then other people will not have to tell you. Other people will not have to stand at the doors and mark your attendance and make sure you're coming on time and not leaving before time and make sure that you're in class and not outside of class. Because you are concerned for yourself. And only when a person is this way, then he can do something. By presenting false excuses, by presenting lies that, you know, I have to go because of this reason, because of that reason, then we are also motivating other people to do the same. We're discouraging other people as well. Because if one person doesn't show up, other people also get demotivated. They also get affected. Their work gets affected.